Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Xin Fan from uh, University of Denver. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Pajam Khalili is uh, Associate Professor at, of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, Northwestern University, where he is Director of the Physical Electron uh, uh, Electronics Research Laboratory. Prior to joining Northwestern, he was an Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UCLA. He received his uh, PhD degree cum laude from Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands, in 2008. Padrum has uh, published over 100 papers in peer-reviewed academic journals and is an inventor of 15 issued patents. He serves on the editorial board of Journal of Physics, Photonics, and uh, the Early Career Editorial Board of Multifunctional Materials. He has served on the technical program committees and organizing committees of several conferences, including the joint 3M Internet Conference, and is a member of the Flash Memory Summit Conference Advisory Board. He and his team placed the top six out of 3,000 entries worldwide in the Cisco Innovation Grand Challenge 2015. He's also a senior member of the IEEE. So without further ado, Dr. Khalili, please go ahead with the talk. Thank you so much, Finn, uh, for the very nice and extensive <laughs> introduction. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank you and Kirill uh, for uh, this opportunity and uh, actually for organizing this wonderful uh, series of lectures. Uh, it's been really great following this over the past few months, and I think it's a tremendous service that you're doing to the community. So thank you. Um, so uh, what I would like to do today is uh, basically uh, tell you a little bit about um, some of the work that we are doing in my group on uh, antiferromagnetic spectronics, basically electrical control of antiferromagnetic order. And uh, our interest in this uh, is primarily in terms of building antiferromagnetic memory and computing devices for high performance computing. And um, so I will tell you basically the motivation that we have in that context. And uh, if you're interested, basically most of the results that I will show are captured in the two papers that are listed on this page, uh, two recent papers. And so if you're interested, you can uh, look at those for more details. So uh, the problem that we are trying to solve is essentially that, um, as, as we all know, uh, the electronics industry is really transforming in, in very fundamental ways. We have devices that are increasingly intelligent and increasingly interconnected. And this goes hand in hand with the fact that the amount of data that we are um, generating and need to process as well as need to communicate is growing exponentially. And that's a big challenge in terms of energy dissipation. There are a number of ways to illustrate that energy challenge, but I will just um, basically illustrate a couple of numbers. Um, so if you look at the energy consumption of data centers uh, only in the United States, um, it's essentially the same as the electricity consumption of the city of Chicago right now. Um, and Chicago, as you know, is the third largest city in the US. So that's a pretty significant amount of energy. If you look worldwide, uh, the situation is similar. So the amount of electricity consumed by data centers worldwide is about the same as a major industrial nation like France. And uh, what makes this worse is that the numbers on the left are actually growing extremely fast. So the number of data, the amount of data that we are storing worldwide is roughly doubling every other year. And so you can imagine uh, how much of a challenge this will be in a few years. There is another way of looking at this, which is really to look at a state-of-the-art um, computing system. And as an example, uh, we can take uh, basically Google's AlphaGo, uh, which was in the news around uh, exactly actually three years ago around this time, uh, where it's, uh, so this is a system that is based on Google's uh, first generation tensor processing units, the TPU, and it managed to beat the human master of Go, uh, which was of course an impressive achievement, 
But uh, what, uh, what is hidden behind this famous picture is, of course, the energy numbers. Uh, so a human brain consumes something around 20 watts or so at most uh, in terms of energy. And uh, it actually does a lot more than just playing a board game while consuming that much energy. And if you compare that to, uh, to the AlphaGo system based on the TPUs, uh, depending on whether it's learning or actually playing the game, it would uh, consume about a megawatt or in the best case around a kilowatt of energy while it's playing, but it's still orders of magnitude different. And so these are, if we were thinking about uh, deploying AI into uh, in, in a wider sense and, and having it solve more problems for us, and in particular, with the rise of um, IoT and extremely low power, self-powered devices uh, where the energy budgets are very much constrained, it's clear that we need new kinds of hardware uh, to do these kinds of high performance computing tasks. So the uh, fundamental reason that uh, computing today, particularly data intensive computing today is so energy hungry is the way that we build computers. So the way that we build computers today is um, based on the idea that we have essentially a processor core or many processor cores, depending on, on the design, which are where the logic actually is. And then we have various tiers of memory that uh, successively become slower, but denser uh, as they go away, as we go farther away from the processor. So the memory that is closest to the processor, which is static random access memory, SRAM, is usually the fastest, but it's very low density. It's something on the order of a few hundred megabytes at most. Um, the off-trip memory, the DRAM, dynamic random access memory, is uh, much denser, but it's also slower. Every time that we have to go off-trip from the CPU or GPU or TPU, to write or read data in the, uh, in the DRAM, there is at least an order of magnitude penalty in terms of speed and in terms of energy. And so that's essentially why it's so difficult to do uh, data intensive computing tasks, for instance, uh, neural networks storage is very, very data intensive. Um, it has to do with basically with this architecture. And the fundamental problem is that SRAM, while it's very fast, does not scale anymore. It doesn't become smaller. It has six to eight transistors. And to make things worse, those are pretty large transistors uh, in advanced technology nodes. And it's very difficult to, to actually uh, uh, put more SRAM bits into a given area. So the focus of existing um, hardware development in industry is basically around this big red arrow that I have here. It's essentially to reduce the energy and latency and bandwidth uh, issues of DRAM. And the sort of the state of the art of that is something called HBM2, high bandwidth memory, uh, which essentially is a way of interfacing this DRAM with the chip, with the, with the GPU chip in this case, uh, that, that reduces the energy consumption. But even taking the the state of the art of this, which is uh, basically NVIDIA's A100 GPU that was announced uh, almost exactly two months ago, in May of this year, uh, they basically um, show, uh, or the, the way that they are selling this product is uh, as part of a computer called the DGX platform, which basically has eight GPUs that's shown on the left here. And what you will immediately notice is that actually most of what you see of this computer here are the heat sinks. So you see eight giant heat sinks on top of these eight little GPUs. Each of these GPUs is burning about 400 watts of power. So the total computer is, is uh, consuming more than three kilowatts. And so this basically illustrates that, you know, even with, with the best case of, um, of high bandwidth memory development, this energy challenge is really there. And it's, it's something that uh, ultimately can only be solved by having more embedded on-chip memory, something that replaces the SRAM, has the same speed ideally, but has much higher density so that we eliminate this, this problem of having 
to go off trip and, and paying the penalty in terms of energy. So that is one of the reasons that there's so much interest today in MRAM, in magnetic random access memory. MRAM fundamentally uses only one transistor to store one bit of information, or more precisely, the combination of one transistor and one magnetic tunnel junction. And uh, basically, all of the major manufacturers, major foundries, semiconductor foundries, uh, have already announced that they either have MRAM in production or uh, very close to production today. And a lot of that has been driven by these trends that, that, I, uh, that uh, I tried to explain in the past few slides. Um, but at the same time, today's generation of MRAM, which is based on uh, the spin transfer torque effect, so STT MRAM, uh, does not yet really pass the finish line as, you know, uh, uh, in, in this, in, in, you know, in terms of solving this problem. It doesn't really uh, successfully address this problem of high performance and high density memory. To illustrate why that is, uh, I think we can take a look at the general landscape of memory technologies that exist today. So on the one end, we have uh, technologies like NAND flash, which is you know, on the um, top left corner here or farther away with the hard disk drives. So these are extremely cost efficient, very high density, but very slow ways of storing data. And then the other limit is SRAM, which is you know, what we were just talking about, which is very fast, but extremely expensive. Um, basically, the, if you calculate the dollars per bit, it's very, very high. There is fundamentally a trade-off in all existing as well as emerging memory technologies between these two, between density, which roughly higher density means lower cost, and high speed. And where we would like to be is this top right corner, right? We would like to have a high density and high speed technology, and that would really solve the high performance computing, AI uh, computing kind of uh, problems that I just uh, uh, referred to. So in the case of spin transfer torque MRAM, the reason that it suffers from this trade-off is apparent from the structure of its bit cell. So one STT MRAM cell basically has a magnetic tunnel junction, which is basically two magnetic layers separated by a tunnel barrier. And I'm sure that most of you in the audience are very familiar with this device. This is what stores the information, right? It stores it as a high or low resistance state. Um, this device goes on top of a select transistor and you need one transistor per cell. Uh, this transistor isolates the MTJ, the tunnel junction that you're trying to read or write uh, from. Um, the size of this transistor is determined by how much current it needs to pass through the tunnel junction while uh, writing. So the faster that you want to switch the tunnel junction, the higher the current, therefore the bigger the transistor will be. And so there is fundamentally a trade-off between density and speed. And as we just saw, what we want is basically an embedded memory that is fast, but also high density at the same time. Both of those are equally important. And so, um, the general theme of problems that my group is working on is essentially uh, finding materials and physical mechanisms beyond ferromagnetic materials and beyond STT that can solve this problem that could potentially uh, push MRAM towards this top right corner. And I will highlight basically just two of those. One is going from current controlled switching mechanisms to voltage controlled, electric field controlled switching mechanisms, where uh, essentially if your switching is only determined by an electric field, then the transistor uh, needs to only apply a particular voltage. It doesn't have to apply a particular current. And that means it could be very small. It could be the smallest that you can make in a given uh, lithography technology. The second one, which is basically the focus uh, of, of, of the remainder of this presentation, is uh, to go from ferromagnetic materials to anti-ferromagnetic materials. And here there are a number of reasons that anti-ferromagnets are interesting, uh, particularly for very high density MRAM. 
One of them is that antiferromagnets, of course, while they have magnetic order, and so they can be non-volatile storage elements for, for information storage, they don't have macroscopic magnetization. There's no macroscopic magnetic moment. And that means that you could basically put uh, antiferromagnetic memory bits extremely close together, and yet they would not magnetically interact. Uh, it has been shown already in the case of ferromagnetic MRAMs, which today are not even very high density, but in the highest density test chips, MRAM test chips that have been shown today, uh, this problem already exists. So it's a very real problem and it will become a larger problem if we are uh, interested in developing higher density MRAMs. Uh, the other reason is that hyperomagnets have exchange dominated dynamics that are, of course, um, in the terahertz range. So we could build devices potentially that are two to three orders of magnitude faster than ferromagnet based devices. So, what I would like to do is basically show you some experiments that we've done on current induced switching and anti ferromagnets. So, first, uh, basically focusing on current control of uh, antiferromagnetic order. And uh, then I will show you basically an idea that we have on electric field control uh, of antiferromagnetic order. So that will be the sort of the remainder of, uh, of my slides here. So uh, before I go any further, I should mention that, of course, um, the field of antiferromagnetic spintronics um, is, is very active today, as I'm sure many of you know. And uh, already within, uh, within this uh, seminar series, I think we saw several uh, uh, beautiful talks uh, related to this topic. And I think there may be a couple more uh, upcoming talks that are also related to this. Um, so uh, th this slide here uh, basically misses uh, many of the, especially of the recent developments there. So I, I have made no attempt to make this a comprehensive slide. But um, um, uh, what I'd like to do here is this is basically just meant to show two flavors of experiments, two flavors of antiferromagnetic devices, where uh, uh, basically the past few, over the past few years, uh, people have tried to perform current control of antiferromagnetic order. So the first uh, type of device, which is shown on the left, and this was first done with copper manganese arsenide, is uh, essentially a type of structure where uh, there is a bulk spin orbit torque, a so-called nail spin orbit torque in the presence of current uh, that can move uh, the main walls. This is, this is a phenomenon that, in, that depends on, on the particular crystal structure of the material and it's entirely a bulk phenomenon. And uh, this really opened the way for, for all of the other progress that has followed in this field. And so this was very important uh, work indeed at the time. Um, the, the, type, the second type of devices that have been explored um, uh, in, in recent years are a little bit more reminiscent of spin orbit torque memories that we're familiar with from ferromagnets. So these are uh, structures where an antiferromagnetic uh, material is interfaced with a heavy metal and you pass a current through this structure, it goes basically through the heavy metal, there is an interfacial spin orbit torque that ex again can exert a torque on the uh, sublattice, uh, on the magnetization sublattices of the antiferromagnet, and it can move the main walls in the antiferromagnet. So it has been observed uh, directly through uh, X-ray linear dichroism experiments, as well as as we saw in one of the uh, previous seminars in this series through spin savic microscopy measurements, that indeed uh, there is a very strong evidence in a range of wide range of materials that uh, you can actually do control of antiferromagnetic order, electrical control of antiferromagnetic order in these materials. Um, and of course, there are various magneto resistance effects that, uh, that one can also use to do electrical heat. So in our case, uh, uh, our starting point was to start basically from the second type of devices that, that I described here, which is heavy metal antiferromagnet heterostructures. And the material that we chose for this was a metallic antiferromagnet, uh, platinum manganese, which is a very well-known antiferromagnet actually in the MRAM 
and uh, magnetic sensor stability. It has been used uh, for a long time uh, as a pinning layer uh, to provide exchange bias in the reference layer of magnetic pommel junctions uh, for sensors as well as for uh, in-plane, the, the earlier generations of in-plane MRAM devices. Uh, so the nice thing about this material is it can be sputtered at room temperature on essentially uh, arbitrary substrates. So it's, uh, there is a pathway to integrate this on CMOS, which is, of course, a requirement to build large memory arrays. And uh, the second uh, thing that we decided to do was to look at confined geometries, so basically small pillars of this material. They are not very small yet compared to what, what would be in a typical memory chip but uh, they are essentially pillars rather than extended films of the material. And so the structure is shown here. You can see the cross, which is basically the dark blue here is the platinum. On top of that, you can see this little platinum manganese pillar. And of course, you can see the measurement pads which are connected to this. Uh, the experiment that we did initially was we sent currents in opposite directions. Uh, uh, 180 degrees uh, with respect to each other uh, along, say, the BB prime direction here on this uh, on this graph. And the way that we read out uh, the nail order, uh, the, the average nail vector essentially in the thermomagnet, in the anti thermomagnet, was by sending an AC current in a perpendicular direction and reading out the second harmonic of that reading current. Um, uh, in the BB prime direction. And this was something that has been used also in other anti ferromagnets before, so uh, it's, uh, the, the measurement technique existed. Uh, but basically, it relies on a combination of the fact that there is an orbit torque, so you can have a manipulation of the uh, nail vector um, that occurs at the same frequency as the input current. And then in addition to that, you have magneto-resistance effects, in particular an isotropic magneto-resistance. And the combination of those two results in a, in a second harmonic signal that can be shown is basically a measure of the average nail vector in your pillar. And just to clarify, again, uh, many of you already know this, but just to clarify, the order parameter here is, of course, not magnetization. That we're, that we're manipulating. It's in fact, the, if we think of our anti ferromagnet in the terms of the simple uh, two sub lattice model, what we're modifying is essentially the uh, average nail vector, which is the vector subtraction of the two magnetization sub lattices. So the experiment we did was we basically uh, applied currents in opposite directions and we successively increase the amplitude of the current that we applied. And then after each write attempt, we basically read out the second harmonic voltage through the uh, 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 procedure that I just described. And so what, what you see if you do this experiment is that indeed there is an apparent switching behavior in this device. So you have a, uh, a voltage, a readout voltage that uh, clearly changes as you change the polarity of the current, but it also increases uh, in, a, in an analog fashion uh, as you, in a gradual analog fashion, as you increase the amplitude of the current. And so there, it seems that there is indeed memory behavior here, uh, but that this is uh, more or less an analog memory, right? So you could basically use this essentially as a multi-level kind of memory where the amplitude of the current that you apply determines what state you get in terms of the readout voltage. Um, we did a, a slightly different experiment next where essentially instead of doing this back and forth switching with different amplitudes, we measured loops. Um, and this is again um, uh, kind of inspired by very similar experiments that you would do in a ferromagnetic memory. Um, so we measured successive loops uh, of, uh, of the readout voltage versus the applied current, uh, starting with loops that are these bluish loops here that have a smaller range of currents and then gradually increasing the range, going to 10 to minus 10 uh, milliamps. And uh, what is significant about this result and is interesting is that we see basically what seems to be plateaus uh, in the readout voltage. And, uh, what, what these show is that essentially you can remove the current and uh, 
upon removing the current, essentially the readout voltage remains where you have programmed it. And this is indeed what you would need in order to have any kind of memory operation. So our interpretation was that what this means is that we essentially have multiple, a very large number of metastable states in this anti-ferro magnet. And uh, by controlling the amplitude of the current and the direction of the current that we apply, we can basically um, uh, program this device to, to go into one or the other of, of these uh, states. These are actually remarkably consistent between different cycles. So if you apply um, the same range of currents uh, repeatedly, essentially you follow the exact same loop. And so uh, this, this shows that indeed uh, there is, a, uh, there is one, what one could call two states, uh, as long as you have the same currents, the same maximum currents applied in opposite directions. So it is possible in principle to use a device like this as a bistable memory. Uh, if you uh, pick, let's say, plus and minus 10 or two or whatever milliamps as your bright currents, but you can also use it as a multi-level analog memory uh, where the amplitude of the current also plays a role in determining the output voltage. So to uh, understand uh, what is going on here, we collaborate with, uh, with uh, the group of Giovanni Finocchio in, uh, in Messina in Italy. Uh, uh, his group has uh, uh, developed uh, basically a code for simulations of anti-paramagnetic dynamics that is uh, uh, that, that captures a lot of the important effects, uh, the, the various different kinds of anisotropy, as well as different kinds of torques that could exist uh, in these structures. And uh, with their help, basically uh, what, uh, uh, what the simulations showed was essentially it was a confirmation of one, what one might expect from, uh, from the data that I just showed you which is that we have domain wall motion in response to currents. Uh, so that is uh, essentially one, what one would expect uh, from uh, the results that I just showed where you have a gradual change in response to current rather than a, an abrupt kind of switching. And this should not be surprising given that the smallest pillars, the smallest platinum manganese pillars that we've looked at so far are about a micrometer in size. So uh, these are large enough to have to contain a fair number of domains in them. Um, and the simulations basically show that you can have reversible motion of, uh, of these domain walls in response to current. And uh, this is kind of illustrated here on the right. And indeed, uh, uh, the result of that is that you have a reversible change of the average nail vector in the pillar. And that is essentially uh, what we think we are reading out electrically. Um, one of the interesting things about these results was that um, unlike uh, some of the uh, earlier experiments in, uh, in uh, electrical control of antiferromagnetic uh, uh, order, uh, where essentially um, uh, what could be described as sawtooth-like um, um, uh, dependence of the output voltage on current, on pulse number uh, was seen, we saw what, what looks more like a step-like uh, dependence. And uh, to put that in another way, um, essentially the output voltage that we see depends on the last largest applied current in a particular direction. So let's say we apply plus 10 milliamps um, to the device, the device will go to a, a particular uh, state uh, that has an output voltage of let's say eight microvolts on this graph. Uh, if we apply more pulses with the same amplitude in the same direction, the output voltage does not change significantly. And so this was something that was qualitatively different from some of the previous reports, not all. Um, and again, we uh, interpret this as, as uh, the existence of, of uh, actual metastable states that we are programming where the, the programming depends on the amplitude of the currents, but not necessarily on the number of pulses that we apply. Um, finally, we also uh, looked at the dependence on the current pulse width, basically the right pulse that we send. Uh, I should mention that as you, as you probably 
uh, could see from the picture of the device that I showed, these are not devices that are designed for high, uh, high speed switching experiments. They don't have uh, microwave measurement pads. And so uh, we didn't necessarily expect them to, to be very fast, but at least down to 10 microseconds, which is the smallest uh, pulse width that we measured, we do see a clear switching signal. Um, and uh, we see a sharp drop of the readout voltage as the pulse width reduces, um, which uh, again, in part at least, we think is because the device pads are just designed, not designed properly and have a lot of heuristics. And this is one of the things that we are now working on to actually design uh, high frequency measurement pads where we can uh, more properly uh, explore how fast this process actually occurs. Um, without going into details, and uh, the details are actually in this uh, uh, paper that is listed here, uh, we also did a similar experiment with tantalum uh, instead of platinum, and again, qualitatively, uh, we see similar results. So there's, uh, this is not something that is limited to platinum as the heavy metal. Now, at this point, it's important to, to mention one thing, uh, one important question that has been uh, also uh, discussed in, in several of the previous um, uh, 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 talks as part of this series. Um, there's, there have been several reports uh, recently where uh, careful experiments were done uh, on similar structures, uh, usually in, uh, in antiferromagnetic oxides uh, interfaced with, uh, with platinum. And it has been shown that indeed, uh, um, the electrical readout signal in some cases can be attributed to resistive switching of the platinum. So uh, when you do an electrical readout in a device like this, particularly when the current densities involved are high, you have to be very careful to make sure that it is indeed magnetic in origin and it is not uh, a resistive signal from the platinum itself. And of course, resistive signals from the platinum can emerge at, at high current densities. This is nothing new uh, because of course you have effects like electromigration or generally motion of atoms at very high current densities, uh, which is a known problem uh, in, in uh, metallic interconnects. And so we have to be very careful in how to interpret electrical measurement data. As I mentioned before, in most of these material systems, there is also direct evidence from X-ray linear dichroism and measurements where, um, uh, which gives a lot of confidence that actually antiferromagnetic order manipulation has happened, uh, but the interpretation of electrical data has to be done very carefully. And so when we saw these reports, we thought, okay, that's, that's something that we have to pay attention to. And what we did was we um, actually went and designed a, um, a modified device structure um, uh, where we can carefully uh, separate the effects of non-electrical switching from the heavy metal from the effects of uh, uh, magnetic switching of the antiferromagnet. Uh, and um, this is, these are very recent results, and so I'm not showing the actual device structure or the details of the experiment, but in short, in this uh, particular device structure and material system that we looked at, um, it's very clear that we, for a range of current densities, I should say, we have very clear switching of the antiferromagnet, while for the same current density and in the same device, we do not have switching from the platinum layer. And so this gives us confidence that indeed, uh, for a wide range of current densities at least, uh, the electrical readout actually is reliable and it is the antiferromagnet that is switching. Although I should say that for very high current densities, so higher than something like 50 mega amps uh, per centimeter square or so, uh, we uh, also see, of course, uh, resistive signals from the platinum, just like uh, other papers have seen. And so again, it's very important, particularly when high current densities are involved to, uh, to, uh, to take these into account and make sure that uh, the signals are antiferromagnetic in, uh, in, in origin. So uh, that kind of uh, summarizes the current controlled um, antiferromagnetic switching part of the presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, 
For ferromagnets as well as for anti-ferromagnets, there are very good reasons to be looking for electric field controlled mechanisms of changing magnetic order. And um, our starting point here is uh, to look at the voltage controlled magnetic anisotropy effect, the so-called VCMA effect. This is essentially the dependence of the interfacial perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, the interfacial PNA, of very thin magnetic layers with uh, adjacent oxides. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effect that was uh, initially uh, observed in the iron MGO system, and it is uh, very widely used for ferromagnetic-based uh, magnetic tunnel junctions, and we and others have used this VCMA effect to switch ferromagnetic tunnel junctions with, uh, with, with very uh, good energy efficiency, among other things. Uh, but the question is, can uh, an, a similar effect be used in the case of antiferromagnets? And we think the answer might be yes. Um, so the starting point is the realization that uh, essentially this effect, the VCMA effect itself, should not be limited to the case of ferromagnets. Um, so if you have thin antiferromagnetic layers that are interfaced with uh, an oxide like MgO, um, for the same reasons that VCMA exists in, anti in ferromagnets, you should also expect uh, to see in appropriate inter designed interfaces uh, VCMA and antiferromagnetic materials. And this is kind of corroborated by first principles calculations that I'm showing here from uh, uh, another one of our collaborators, uh, Nick Kiusis at uh, Cal State Northridge. Uh, where they looked at the interface of, in this case, iron rhodium and MGO, uh, as well as other antiferromagnets and MGO. And what they see is that, in fact, uh, uh, the numbers that you get from these calculations for the VCMA at these interfaces are comparable, actually, to ferromagnets. And uh, so they, they are large enough to, to think about building actual devices out of them. Now, how would we then use VCMA in order to, to switch an anti magnet? Well, uh, this is kind of illustrated here. So we start from the uh, kind of the, the left panel here. Uh, so the left panel basically shows this dielectric, uh, which might be the MGO and the anti magnet. And we're assuming here in this model that uh, you have uh, basically an anti magnet that has an, an isotropy that is perpendicular to the interface with the, uh, with the uh, dielectric. So the two sub-lattices, the red and blue arrows here are pointing left, right, for instance. So what VCMA would do is it would simply reorient. If you apply a voltage and you keep the voltage there, and this voltage is large enough, um, what VCMA would do is it, it would simply change the anisotropy from being perpendicular to plane to being in plane. And so the uh, two sub-lattices would basically reorient to be uh, parallel to the interface. And that's shown in the middle panel. Um, the, the basic question that we're asking is uh, the following. If we apply a voltage pulse that is short, um, would we be able to resonantly switch both of these sub-lattice magnetizations? In other words, would we be able to excite a dynamic um, uh, coupled procession of the two sublattice magnetizations such that uh, by tuning our voltage pulse to half the procession period, such that we would get a switching in both of those um, magnetization sublattices? And the result of that would, of course, be that we would go from uh, a nail vector that is pointing one way to uh, the opposite direction uh, in response to this voltage. Uh, this is an idea that is very similar to, uh, to the processional switching of ferromagnets using VCMA, which is something that, again, we and others have, have done in the past. Uh, and uh, the key difference would be that the pulses we are talking about here would have to be extremely short. They would be really in the picoseconds time scale range because that coupled oscillation, rather than being in the gigahertz um, uh, frequency range, would, would, would be in the hundreds of gigahertz 
Um, so we uh, implemented a simple um, uh, macro spin model of antiferromagnetic dynamics in the presence of the of VCMA. And it looks like, at least in our simulations, the idea basically works. Uh, so the first case that I'm filming here is where uh, basically we are applying this voltage and we keep it there, right? So that's the first of the two scenarios that I just described. We apply the voltage and uh, if this voltage is large enough to overcome the perpendicular anisotropy of uh, both of the sublattices, uh, basically the two sublattices will start a coupled oscillation that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, occurs as soon as you apply this voltage pulse. And if we wait long enough, basically this damped coupled oscillation will reorient the two magnetizations from being along the x-axis here to being along the z-axis, which is parallel to the interface. But what you will notice is that very shortly after this oscillation has started, both of these sublattice magnetizations, M1 and M2, are very close to the opposite direction, right? So M1 moves very close to where M2 used to be, and M2 moves very close to where M1 used to be. And so essentially, if we terminate the voltage pulse here, we would get a, uh, 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 basically both of these magnetizations would reach an equilibrium uh, in this new direction, and we would have essentially 180 degree switching of the NL vector. Now, um, this is, um, uh, of course, at this point, at a stage of simulations, we don't have any experiments at, uh, at this point yet. Uh, but uh, just to mention why we think that this could be interesting uh, as a switching mechanism for anti-ferromagnets. I think the main reason is that um, the switching speed in this case, basically the, the time scale of this reversal, is determined by this coupled oscillation, by the frequency of that coupled oscillation, the antiferromagnetic dynamics. And the frequency is extremely high, right? It's dominated by exchange. And that's why for typical values of, of, of an antiferromagnetic metal in this case, we, we got uh, about 20 picoseconds in terms of the switching speed. On the other hand, the threshold to bring about the switching the voltage required to initiate these dynamics is not set by the exchange interaction. It's only set by the anisotropy, uh, which is uh, actually much smaller. And so you could imagine uh, basically uh, having fairly small electric fields on the order of 100 millivolts or so uh, for a one nanometer uh, tunnel barrier. Uh, uh, that would be basically comparable to switching voltages or even lower than switching voltages uh, that, uh, that are commonly used in ferromagnetic tunnel functions. Uh, yet the switching speed would be, of course, very high because it's, it's dominated by exchange. Um, so that's basically all I had. And at this point, uh, I would like to, of course, thank you all for, for listening and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. But before that, I'd like to just uh, thank all of the people who did the actual work that I just described. Uh, uh, most importantly, uh, uh, Dr. Victor Lopez Dominguez, uh, who is a postdoc in my lab and has, uh, has been uh, 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 very important to do all of this work that I just showed, as well as my students, uh, Ji Cheng Shi and Sev Pachi, who are both working on uh, uh, a switching of uh, antiferromagnetic uh, control of antiferromagnetic order and different materials. And uh, I mentioned also our collaboration with the group of Giovanni Pinocchio for uh, micromagnetic modeling, which has been very important to this work. And of course, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making all of this uh, possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, so it's time for questions. If you have any questions in Zoom, please use the raise hand option. And uh, if you are watching this on Twitch, and uh, please type your questions in the uh, chat box in Twitch. Uh, uh, Kirill, do you want to ask the first question? <laughs> 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have a question about um, potential applications in, in, in memory that, that, that um, you discussed. And one issue that's, uh, that's specific to antiferromagnets, perhaps, well, not just specific, but uh, relevant in a little more, uh, um, a little more relevant than to ferromagnets. So uh, these torque switching uh, schemes of VCMA switching, I think it 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 uh, mostly works for materials with in-plane anisotropy. And um, when when you consider the scalability uh, requirements that you want to make the bit as small as possible, because there is no shape anisotropy to rely on. You have to rely on anisotropy alone, and it seems like the limitations for scaling the bits down would be more uh, problematic compared to ferromagnets. So can you comment about the scalability? Because I understand all of these prototypes work with very large bits, right? So you need sure. to scale it down by, by orders of magnitude to get to uh, tens of nanometers at least. Yeah. And okay. getting to 70 kT might be a problem. So, um, uh, yeah. So um, the uh, so for the case of um, uh, of uh, VCMA uh, switching, basically uh, in the case of ferromagnets, uh, where there, there there's a lot of um, experimental data now, um, the majority of the work is actually on perpendicular. Uh, magnetic tunnel junction. So essentially what you're doing at those experiments is you are, uh, the, the voltage that you're applying is changing the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And so uh, you, you, uh, you switch it basically between two opposite perpendicular states. Uh, in that case, the main uh, difficulty with um, scaling of, of ferromagnetic VCMA devices and at the same time keeping the uh, retention time is that as you make these devices smaller, you, in order to keep the same energy barrier, you need to increase the anisotropy. You need to increase the perpendicular anisotropy. And uh, assuming that you can do that, you also need a larger VCMA coefficient uh, to overcome that anisotropy. And so, that is a, a, a very fundamental challenge. And what that means is that essentially, if you, um, if you use a metric like you know, the ratio of the energy barrier over the switching voltage, that's probably a good metric for, for a memory device. Uh, that metric is directly proportional to the VCMA coefficient. So you need to have a large VCMA coefficient to have a large retention time and simultaneously a small switching voltage. The case of spin orbit torque devices is a little bit different. Uh, spin orbit torque, of course, the physics of it is different and particularly fast switching with ferromagnets is easier to do in, in the case of spin orbit torque if, if you are in plane. And so there is a challenge of, of, of scaling. Uh, for the case of antiferromagnets, like you mentioned, I mean, the, uh, the uh, as far as I'm aware, actually, the devices that I showed, which are you know uh, just under a micron in diameter, are probably the smallest uh, that, uh, that that were uh, anybody's done antiferromagnetic switching, and these are very far away from you know uh, tens of nanometers or even single digit nanometers that that we would be interested in eventually. Um, and so I think uh, I think it's you know uh, the, the the main question there. And this is something that I think we still need to work on, is really getting a good understanding of what even determines the retention time in the case of antiferromagnets. And at least to, to me, it's not very clear um, um, what the scaling rules would be for the retention time. And I think that's a very important question, uh, actually. Um, and something that is related to that is that as we go to smaller geometries, of course, at some point, we would be crossing over uh, from this domain wall mediated switching that we've shown and almost all of the other uh, similar experiments have shown to a single domain kind of switching. And, and I think a fundamental question there is, uh, 
does that help in terms of making the switching more efficient or does that actually hurt us? Um, and I think it could go either way. And uh, again, there are parallels to that also in thermomagnetic switching, the kind of unexpected things that happen as you go to less than 30 nanometer diameters in, in MRAM bits. So, uh, so, which in that case actually turned out to be helpful. And, uh, and so, but I think this, these are all things that, that are open questions at this point. Yeah. In terms of retention, is there any reason to believe it's going to be anything other than the uh, 70 kT rule for ferromagnets? Um, no, so I think, yeah, if you want, essentially, that would depend on the product you're trying to make uh, for a long-term uh, data retention, like um, a flash memory or you know, 10 years data retention kind of thing. You need uh, 70 or so, uh, depending on the temperature. Um, uh, for uh, some of the applications that, that I talked about, like SRAM replacement, um, uh, retention, long-term retention is usually optional. So what they care about more is actually the density and the speed, uh, typically because uh, those bits are overwritten so frequently that it's very uh, uh, unlikely that you would retain data there for more than say a few minutes or so. Uh, but it would depend on the application. But even in those cases, even in cases where the uh, 70 kT barrier is not needed for retention purposes, uh, it may be needed for other reasons. Uh, and so, for example, in the case of ferromagnetic uh, VCMA devices, uh, one of the effects of the energy barrier, having the higher energy barrier, is that the error rates become lower. So, even if you may need not necessarily need a long retention time, you may still still need uh, to meet a certain retention time just because it helps with the error rate. So maybe not 70, but 40 or 30. It, yeah, I think it would depend on, it, it would really depend on the specifics of the specs that you're trying to meet. But yeah, there is, there is definitely a minimum. It can't be below a certain amount. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, Emra, please go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. I wonder if uh, there has been any imaging studies for platinum mag magnesium, uh, manganese, as in nickel oxides or other antiferromagnets? Um, we have not done this uh, yet. Um, I, uh, I kind of know from some experiments, I. I'm not sure that I can, I can basically say much more about that, um, where there is evidence of this, but I, uh, but my group has not done this yet. No. So no one has done it, but people are trying. I, I wouldn't say, I didn't say that no one has done it. I just, I don't, as far as I know, it's not published. And so that's why. I, <laughs> Another question is the, uh, have you done any, Mm, nanoscale imaging of the material. What kind of grain sizes do you have? What kind of crystal crystallinity? Right, right. That's a that's a very good question. Um, now we not we don't know what the grain size is. Uh, we are doing related experiments right now. Actually, trying to look at different um, different phases of the material and see what the effect is on. On, on these, on all of these experiments that I described, um, based on you know what what others have done, you know a typical um, number that we've seen in literature for for grain size in these materials prepared in similar ways, room temperature sputtering, somewhere around ten to twenty nanometers or so, and so that's our guess is that ours cannot be very far from that, um, but yeah, we I, I don't have I don't have the actual data for you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, do you have other questions? Um, I actually have, a, have, have one uh, technical question. For the voltage controlled uh, uh, FM and uh you said in the model you used the macro spin model. Uh, was that just a, uh, like two layers? like two magnetic layers, anti-ferromagnetic coupled together? 
yeah, it's basically just uh, uh, two uh, couple LNG equations where the coupling is through the exchange. And in addition to that, we have uh, the uniatural and isotropy, which is a function of voltage. Function of that, okay. And uh, so uh, does that kind of material uh, exist? If so, can you like uh, suggest what antiferromagnet yeah. That's an insulator. I feel. Oh no, that's not an insulator. Was that was that a metal metallic? Yeah, right. So uh, I showed the sort of the calculation that I showed from one of our collaborators was for iron rhodium, which is a metal. Um, there are there is only one experiment uh, that I'm aware of, um, and unfortunately, I don't have the paper citation here. Uh, I'm certainly happy to look it up and send uh, send it to you. Uh, where there is in my view, kind of indirect evidence that of the dependence of interfacial anisotropy on voltage. That I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was an iridium manganese, a very thin iridium manganese layer. But, uh, but I think, yeah, as far as that idea, I think the first step certainly is to actually conclusively demonstrate and measure the VCMA effect in, in, in any antiferromagnet. But that, that, that was not been done yet. I think, again, there is, I think there is indirect evidence and uh, fundamentally there, there's good reason to believe that it can be done, um, but, uh, but we have not done it yet. Yeah. Can you suggest a, a, a convenient way to measure the anisotropy of the antiferromagnet? Ah, that's a very good question and I don't have a very good answer. I mean, the, the, uh, the obvious way <laughs> is to couple it to a ferromagnet, but, but that will certainly change, change the, a lot of the physics. And so I think, I mean, with, with like, like with so many other uh, ideas and anti-ferromagnets, uh, accurate measurement, quantitative measurement of, of an isotropy, uh, among other things, is, uh, is very difficult. And so that's, um, yeah, it's, this is no exception. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do you have other question? Let's see if there's any question on Twitch. No. Oh, there's one question. Uh, Golan, please go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Uh, hi, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So I just uh, want to know, like, uh, during the uh, structure growth, like the platinum manganese is uh, crystalline or it's amorphous? Um, it's it's uh, polycrystalline, uh, so uh, it's not it's not amorphous certainly, but it, it's a polycrystalline. So typically, uh, the way that we prepared this is um, uh, we have a thermally oxidized silicon substrate, and we do room temperature sputter deposition on it, and uh, typically what you would get in, in these films is a polycrystal, so there's a grain structure. And for the substrate platinum, like which plane you are using, like platinum 101 or? Um, so uh, we looked at them not in the same structure that I showed, but in a very similar structure, and it is 111. And yeah, typically, uh, if you if you sputter platinum um, on on this kind of a substrate, you would, that's what you would get. Predominantly, that's what you would get. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Any other question? Let's see. Okay. So if there's a, um, no other question, I want to thank the uh, speaker again, and I want to thank everyone for participating.